Have you ever uh, waited for the, the perfect bite of something and, and uh, like in New England seafood or maybe down the Southwest, that perfect steak, or maybe here, you know, that hot fudge sundae with caramel and uh, the pecans. Are you guys hungry yet? You know, it's lunch after this. You know, you always love it when someone knows how to make something that's perfect. Like when we lived down south, I remember that they had the corner at a time on fried chicken and, and the New England clam bakes. There's nothing quite like it, and et cetera, et cetera. Did you know, in that sense, to see perfect worship, God lets us see that in heaven. And specifically this morning, when God gets to write down the lyrics of worship. Now, he's written a lot. The book of Psalms, there, there are little hymns and praises throughout the scripture. But when God gets to take that whole body of his revelation and then have it offered back to him in perfect, just right, the way he wants it worship, we get to hear the product. In fact, this morning, when God writes the lyrics, it's what we see in the songs of heaven's worship. So this morning, this is how I look at this chapter. And let's open our Bibles to Revelation 5. Because as you're opening there, you're opening to the, the best portion of Scripture in, in the greatest book of the Bible that gives us the, the greatest opportunity of seeing the worship around the throne of the presence of God. And what's amazing is when they worship God in heaven... It's in English. You understand now, I know it's been translated, but it's not unintelligible is what I'm saying. It's not mysterious, it's not code. What we're gonna look at, especially starting in verse eight, and then really the, the song that's in verses nine and 10, is completely understandable. It's, it's in very clear language. But what we're looking at is a perfect offering that's given to the Lord by those saints in heaven. Well, the, the first thing is we look at the worship offered to God in heaven. It's distilled down in the Bible. The, the perfect worship of heaven has been distilled down in the Bible. And it's been offered, energized by the Spirit of God. In fact, true worship is, is when the Spirit of God prompts us to realize the absolute worthiness and immensity and grandeur of God and our utter unworthiness and insignificance and and our total weakness in the presence of his might. But that's what heaven's like. It's just God at the center of everything. And so as we look today at the recorded content, crossing the threshold into the spiritual world, we find God giving us the actual wording that draws upon what facets they worship about Christ. In fact, this is what they, the redeemed, because it's the first time they sing, gathered looking at the Lamb around his throne. This is what the Spirit of God prompts in these perfected saints. Remember, when we die at the instant of death, in fact, tonight we're going to talk about death and cremation. You know, I mean, what a what an exciting topic, right? You know, but, but the instant of our death or of Christ's return for us in the clouds, that instant we're glorified, we're perfected, we're made perfectly, sinlessly able to completely do what God wants us to do. And that's what we're looking at. That kind of worship that comes from these glorified, perfected individuals. And God records the lyrics. And so today, we're going to look at the recorded content but what we're looking at is actually the third of 14 of these recorded offerings. Now you realize that if, if Revelation was a worship, worship service, there are 14 offerings of worship within that worship service. 14 doxologies. Doxa means glory. Logeia is sayings or, or words about or teachings of or knowledge of. And so the, the speaking about the glory of God are doxologies. And there are 14 of them in this book. In fact, just for a moment, uh, before we, before we uh, jump into this list of 14, I want to read with you this one that we're going to study in depth this morning. And, and I, it, it's, it's amazing that this is the first of the 14. The reason I picked it out, the first two in Revelation 4 are only chanted and spoken. 
this is the first one that is sung around the throne. And a lot of times we talk about singing in heaven. This is an actual recording of singing in heaven. It's Revelation 5. We're going to start in verse 8, read down to verse 10. Let's stand together for the reading of the word of God, and let's ask the Lord to, to take this passage, this first recorded song in the Bible, and teach us the lessons that they know that we need to learn. And... Uh, that the Lord will open this passage to our hearts. Starting in verse 8. Now when he had taken the scroll, and we covered that two weeks ago, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each one having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Verse 9. And they sang a new song. It's the first time singing is ever talked about in heaven since creation. The last song, the Bible says, was in heaven, was before the rebellion of Lucifer at the days of creation. The angel choirs were singing. They haven't sung since the fall. Now singing starts in heaven again. And it's a new song. And look at what it says in the rest of verse 9. It has seven lines or seven stanzas. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open the seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. The first song of 14 doxologies, the lyrics captured by God for our learning. Let's bow together for a word of prayer. Father, I pray that you would teach us. You captured this song you wrote it down in the revelation of Jesus Christ. You gave it to John to give to the church. And it's for a purpose. And I pray we would realize that purpose as we study your word. May your spirit open to our hearts today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. As you're seated, I, I think about this past July, uh, a whole group, of, actually it was the end of June, a whole group of pilgrims from Calvary Bible Church went off to study the book of Romans in Rome. And, and in the months leading up to it, for at least 10 months, I was constantly called, visited, texted, emailed, stopped in the halls, and they'd say, um, what kind of outlets do they have over there? Because we want to make sure that our plug-ins work. Um, can you use your ATM card over there? Um, how, how do you get from the airport to the... Um, do you know... What, and, it, and what it was is they weren't there yet, but they were what? They were getting ready. You see, when you know where you're going, and especially if it's something very special to you, you think about it a lot and you want to get ready. I really believe that's the whole purpose of the book of Revelation. If you read about it, it was a gift from God the Father to his son Jesus Christ to give to his church to show us, to reveal to us something. And what he wants to reveal to us is what he's going to do with the world and what he's looking for in the church. But in this section, in chapter 4 and 5, to prepare us for being a part of that worship. And so, these doxologies all are preparatory. Let me just take you through all of them. Look back at chapter 4, verse 8. And I just want to, if you've never seen them, walk with me. I'm not going to expound at all on them. I'm just going to point them out. Notice that each one, starting in chapter 4, verse 8, this one is the living creatures. This first doxology doesn't come from the, the 24 elders or the redeemed or anything else. It comes from these four probably their cherubim, and it's what's called in theology the tri uh, It's Hagias means holy, so it's the three times God is called holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Then, in, in verse 11, you find that the 24 elders fall down, and they say something. So this is the representative group circling the throne. It's verse 11 of chapter 4. No singing yet. They say, you are worthy, O Lord, and notice, here's a, something as you're reading through these, you can notice, they're not the same. This one is a threefold. Notice that it says, to receive glory, honor, and power. Now, slip down to today's that we're going to study. In verse 9, it says they sing a new song, and here come these lines of truth. But this one is sung, and, and it's the first one. It says in, in verse 9 that they sang a new song. Now move on to verse 12, same chapter. Now 
the group that's in verse 11, it's the voice of many angels, it's the living creatures, it's the elders, and, and it's, it's such a large host that it just says myriads of myriads. It's an uncountable number. But look what they do in verse 12. They say, and it says, with a loud voice. It's interesting that sometimes it says they're crying, sometimes it says they're singing, and sometimes it says there's a loud voice, and by the time we get to the last one, it's even thundering during this. So, so it's amazing, but this one is a little different. There are seven, it's, it's a seven-fold doxology. It says, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power, riches, wisdom, strength, honor, glory, blessing. Seven different elements. Then in verse 13, here's another one. And in it, this time, every creature in heaven and on earth joins in to, and, and some of these we're not sure if they're antiphonal, we're not sure if, if there's some type of, of correspondence between them, but they're all incredibly rich and beautiful. But this is a fourfold. You notice that it says, blessing, honor, glory, power be to the one on the throne. Then you have to go all the way to chapter 7, verse 10. And if you flip over there, now we have the multitude that have come out of the great tribulation. These are the ones that are, that are uh, wearing white robes and they have the palms and, and that they have been martyred. They're, they're the product of the evangelism of these witnesses. And look what they say in verse 10. It says they're crying and, and that ongoing activity. It doesn't mean it's once. They didn't say it once. This is... They're crying out with a loud voice saying, so this is a repeated one, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And you can imagine that it's, it's an it's a in unison, almost powerful repetition over and over. They're saying this, this, this big crowd. Keep going down to verse 12. Uh, after hearing this for a while, all the angels around the throne in verse 11, the elders and the four creatures fall on their face during this worship time. And in verse 12 another sevenfold doxology. Amen, which means they agree with, with what they said in verse 10. And then they say blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to God. So another beautiful offering. You have to go all the way to chapter 11 and verse 16 for the next one. And this is uh, the, the seventh trumpet is sounded and the 24 elders in verse 16 fall on their faces and worship God and now comes this speaking they're not singing again they're saying verse 17 we give thanks O Lord God Almighty it, it often these these are are actually the giving of thanks many of them for what the Lord has done now look at chapter 15 this one is fascinating uh, it says that they sing now we're back to singing in chapter 15 verse 3 the song of Moses the servant of God and the song of the Lamb Song of Moses, the Old Testament, Deliverer and Redeemer, the Song of the Lamb, the New Testament, uh, work of Christ. And they say, great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are your ways, and on through. Then we get to chapter 16, verses 5 and 6. And uh, this is one that's interesting. Look at verse 5. The angel of the waters. The angel of the waters. I mean, we think of water to boat on and fish. I mean, do you think of an angel in charge of the waters and this angel of the waters says an amazing offering to the Lord you are righteous O Lord the one who is and the one who was and the one who is to be because you have judged these things and there's this this declaration of God's justice in all that he does uh, verse 7 um, is is now another interesting one and another from the altar. So it's probably another angel, another of the same kind. It's another uh, praise and doxology, but it's probably an angel of the altar that, that maybe maintains the altar or speaks out from the altar, or it could be the altar speaking. But even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. Amazing uh, reminder that everything that God does is right. You know, sometimes we watch a, a scene and where someone's getting what we think they deserve, but we're not sure, and we're not sure. They cheer in heaven when people are judged because anything God does is righteous and true. Uh, look at chapter 19. This is the run-up, uh, the four hallelujahs, this is called. But this is the second coming of Christ. He breaks through the, the clouds uh, riding in verse 11. But in the run-up to that, starting in verse 1, we have the first of the four hallelujahs, and, uh, or hallelujahs. It's the Greek form of the Hebrew hallelujah is alleluia. But 
verse 1 says, I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven. Now, now imagine, you know, you can hear the murmur of a lot of voices, but can you imagine everyone, a countless multitude, saying the same thing together? Just the power of those united voices. And so they say, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. Back to a fourfold doxology. And then they say the true and righteous. Verse 3, another one. And they said, Alleluia. Verse 4 is the third Alleluia. And this time it's the 24 elders and the four living creatures fall down and they say, Amen. In other words, I agree with, with uh, the big crowd. And they repeat it, Alleluia. Then a voice came, verse 5, from the throne, saying, Praise our God, all you his servants. So that's when you get into verse 6, which is the final of these doxologies. And it says, It was as, as if it was the voice of a great multitude, the sound of many waters, the sound of mighty thundering. See, it's just growing. It's not just the voices of everybody, but now it's the mighty thunderings and again they say, Alleluia, for the Lord our God reigns. Well, let's go back to chapter 5, because I don't want to get distracted from examining this one. And what's so important is this is the words of the very first song in Revelation. This is the first time we hear what is being said as the worship song is being offered to the Lord. And uh, I'll put the words in front of you, because I want you to see the seven different lines of truth. It, it's very clear divisions, concepts, thoughts, ideas, facets, as it were, of Christ that they're talking about. And in each of these lyrics that God wrote, teach us what was on the heart and mind of these perfected ones, because they are offering perfected praise to the Lord. Now, watch what it says. You are worthy to take the scroll. We saw that two weeks ago. This is the title deed to the universe and to open the seals. That's the unleashing of what's in it. Remember, um, taking a seal off a scroll is much like pulling the pin out of a grenade. When you break the seal, it, it explodes forth the, what is going to happen, the judgment that's contained. Until the seal is broken, the judgment tarries. But when the seal is broken, the pin is pulled, and it just explodes out of there. So what they're saying is, you're the one that has the right to judge. For you were slain, that whole idea of the sacrifice of Christ. Now redemption comes in, and by the way, this is the middle of the seven. Uh, it's like one, two, three, four, is right in the center, five, six, seven. And the middle one is you have redeemed us to God by your blood. Speaking of the sacrificial, atoning sacrifice of Christ. Then what's fascinating is, the, the way that the ancient world and the Bible describes all humanity usually is in a fourfold manner. You know, it says they come from the east and the west and the north and the south, the four points of the compass. At times it talks about the four corners of the earth. Or here, this designation is where it says that out of every tribe, out of every tongue, out of every people, out of every nation. So what it's saying is representative of all humanity, every division of it and have made us kings and priests to our God. They're talking about their current state. They're in the kingdom, and they're, they have access, and they can come before the Lord as a priest does. And then this fulfillment. Remember Jesus said, if you come with me, that, that you'll reign with me. And, and this whole idea that, that they know that the time is coming when the rebellion will be put down, and they will actually reign over God's creation with the Lord. So, Basically, what we're looking at is how they worship the Lord. What are the targets of the glorified saints' worship in heaven? What, what are they targeting? Well, number one, they worship Jesus as the owner of the universe. And, and uh, sometimes we don't think of this. I mean, sometimes, like last night, uh, you know, Bonnie and I went out and looked at the stars, and we thought, wow, those are beautiful. But we don't think that anybody owns those. It's kind of like looking at the ocean, you know? It's like... I know we have territorial rights and 200 mile out and fishing rights and everything, but who owns the ocean? God does. See, he, Jesus steps forth taking the scroll, which is a title deed, and he says, I own this. And, and you know, to know someone that owns such vastness speaks of their power. Uh, I, I've told you many times I had an interesting roommate when I was in college, a good friend of mine. Uh, I didn't know him that well, but as I got to know him as the months went by, 
He told me that his parents owned 16 square miles of Texas, 10,000 acres. His, just his mom and dad, not his aunts and uncles and grandparents, just his mom and dad owned 10,000 acres, and they raised things on their 10,000 acres, or 16 square miles. They raised oil wells. And the way I know that is that the whole time, that was back when couriered things were not as simple. This is in the 70s. He used to have every week a legal document couriered to him because he was a part of the ownership of these, and he would have to sign because they drilled and found oil every month, more wells. And every month they would send and courier the, the deeds to these wells, and you know how they're maintained by the big oil companies and everything. And my friend, he would always show me he was signing that. And I remember one time I went to visit him, and I went to see his aunt. He says, oh, you'll love her house. He says, you probably like, you know, Africa and stuff. He said, her whole house is in Africa. Well, it looked like a mall, and we got there. And the dining room table was held up by elephant tusks, and I don't know how... You know, I think that's endangered, but, you know, don't go there. But the seats, every seat around the table was an elephant foot from the knee down, made a real one, made leather, tanned. It was, it had the toenails and everything. I mean, oh, man, you know, and you sat on this elephant's foot <laughs> as a stool. And, I mean, that was just that room. And every room was, was similarly decorated with animals that you... You were either the rugs or into a couch or they were on the ceiling or something. I mean, it was just unbelievable. And I said, wow. He says, well, they have a lot of acres of oil wells. And, and I thought, whoa, they were some of the wealthiest people I'd ever met. That's nothing compared to this. Jesus is the owner of the universe. He is the one who created it and he owns it, everything. And so, you know, that just, that's amazing to think about the, the significance of Jesus owning everything. Jesus is the Son of God, the creator of all things. He has a name that's above every name, and at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Secondly, they worship Jesus now as the owner and creator, as the judge of all things in heaven. Notice what they said. You are, are worthy to open its seals. Only Jesus can unleash the, the wrath of God we saw two weeks ago. In fact, I was reading the comment cards. One of the college students wrote, wow, those were awesome numbers. I thought, yeah, awesome numbers about death. Those, those were, uh, you know, this filmmaker that's in the news right now, and he says, I regret that the ambassador died, and da-da-da-da. Can you imagine, though, breaking one of those seals kills a fourth of all the people alive on the planet? That someone would have to think a long time before they pulled that pin out of that grenade. Jesus said, I can do it. Because John 5, God has delivered all judgment to me. Jesus is the judge. He is the one that's going to sit on the great white throne. He is the one that when he comes in the clouds, it says that everybody, if you read in Isaiah 13 and also in Matthew 24 and, and Rome, Revelation 6, it says that the people see him coming and they start mourning and they start looking for caves and holes and rocks and they want to be down with the moles underground. They don't want to see him because he's the judge. And see, that's what they worshiped in heaven, that Jesus is the judge of all. Thirdly, if you're looking at chapter 5, verse 9, it says this third element is they worship Jesus as the lamb that was slain for the world. Jesus is the lamb that was slain. Remember what John the Baptist pointed at? Jesus said, behold, the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. They said, Jesus is the lamb that was slain. He was slain for the sin of the world. And, and so... Jesus is the Lamb of God, the once and for all sacrifice for sin offered on the altar of the cross. Do you remember last week Mike Jenner was talking about the Hebrews 10, that by one sacrifice he has forever paid the price? They worship in heaven that Jesus was the Lamb that was slain. Fourthly, and this is the central one, remember, um, we're Occidental, we're, we're Westerners. Uh, we think very much differently than orientals and hebrew language is an oriental language remember oriental languages go from the right side of the page to the left that's an oriental language occidental languages go from the left side or the west side of the page oriental languages orient from the east side of the page 
Ori and Occidental from the west side of the page. But the Oriental mind thinks differently, and, and they think more in form. In fact, in Hebrew, poetry is not captured by rhyme, it's captured by structure. In fact, if you understand Hebrew Old Testament poetry, you have to learn the structure because that's what captures and retains the poetic message. One thing they loved is in a list of seven, the one in their mind that stood out the most was the fourth because it was like this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And that fourth one, if you notice, in all of Lamentations 3, you know, the, the Lord's mercies are new every morning. That is the very beginning of the fourth poem, that verse. That's the high point, great is thy faithfulness, of the whole book of Lamentations. And that's how they think in that, that seven heptatic thought. So this is the fourth one. This is the high one. They worship Jesus as the Redeemer. Jesus is the one who alone could redeem us. No one else was worthy. He did so with his blood. I mean, that, that concept is, is so powerful, and we're going to see a little bit later that it's underscored by the most frequent title of Christ in the book of Revelation, which speaks of his redemption. But Jesus, who was holy and harmless and undefiled, became sin. See, Hebrews says that, that he was separate from sin, but Paul said he became sin for us. He who knew no sin was made sin so he could purchase us in him we have redemption through his blood, even the complete forgiveness. And what they're talking about is, as Redeemer, I am completely, by him, set free from my sin. And then, they worship Jesus as Savior. Uh, it's interesting, Jesus said he came to seek and to save what? The lost. What, what did Jesus do when he saw a crowd of people? He was drawn toward them with compassion. He was moved. It was, it was very visceral. He, he was gripped by compassion for the lost, for the downtrodden. In fact, Jesus said, I came to seek and save the lost, and I'm leaving you behind. I can't do it all myself. I want you to go to every creature and share the gospel, Matthew, or Mark 16. Go into all the world, Matthew 28. And be my witnesses, Acts chapter 1, from Jerusalem to Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the earth. And, and look, what, look in the center of, of this, this wonderful him to the Lord in verse 9, out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You know what that means? The Great Commission has succeeded. Have you ever thought about that? We know it succeeds. We know that people are saved from every kingdom and tongue and tribe and nation because they're there safely in heaven. What a wonderful truth to see that and know that Christ's plan. Jesus, who was moved with compassion, called out those who were weary in their sins and heavy laden in their frustrations. He promises them rest, and he promises us that he goes with us as we are ministers of his reconciliation, Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5. I am an ambassador for Christ. I represent Christ, and I can bring to people the reconciliation that God offers to them when I present the gospel. It's a little different than just saying, yeah, I got a witness. I get to be a representative of God, an ambassador of his reconciliation. They worship Jesus as Savior. They worship Jesus also as the great high priest. If you look in verse 10, you see that first line of verse 10, and have made us kings and priests to our God. Christ's redemption brings us into the kingdom. That's the, the kings is, is not, you know, all these little individual kings, but into the, the kingship and under the kingdom of God and priests. A priest was a person who, who had close access and represented the God. So we are brought into his kingdom and given this close access representing him as those who are join heirs with Christ, as, as fellow priests. Jesus is the new and living way. He has opened God's presence. Now we're able to come and bring our gifts. And then look at the very end of verse 10. It says, and we shall reign on the earth. They worship Jesus as the king of kings. Christ promise that as we're joint heirs with him, that we will reign with him. Remember he says, if, if you follow me and give up mother and sister and houses and lands, I'll give you 10,000 and I will let you reign with me. Remember what he promised Adam, that, that he would be having dominion over and that was quickly lost and Satan became the one with the dominion. Now is the promise restored. And, and we are able to reign with him. And what's amazing is the weak of this world 
now are strong with him as king. The poor of this world now are rich with him as king. The promised rule of a world and universe are given to us who are joint heirs with Christ. Well, now look back at verse 6 because I went over it real fast of chapter 5, verse 6, but something happens in verse 6 that is monumental in this book. It's the first time Jesus is called by a title. And it happens to be the most frequent title for Christ in heaven. That should kind of jump off the page to us. When, when they are perfected and when they're worshiping God perfectly and when they're energized completely by the Spirit, when they're undistracted, like, like so easy it is for us to be, what are they calling Jesus most? He's called the Lamb. In verse 6 is the first time. And by the way, it's not the first time in the Bible. Jesus is called the Lamb three times prior. John 1, 29, behold the Lamb of God. John 1, 36, the Lamb of God. 1 Peter chapter 1, he's the Lamb, the unblemished Lamb. Three times in all the New Testament, 29 times here. You understand that over 90% of the occurrences of this title are, are all concentrated right here in the book of Revelation. And the reason for that is that the Lamb speaks of Jesus as his sacrificial, redemptive, blood-shedding redeemer. See, that, that, that's tied that a lamb that was holy and harmless and, and innocent and was a substitute was killed and, and blood shed, and that blood was as a substitute. That's what a lamb, lamb offerings were. I can't atone for my sins, so I'm taking this innocent lamb, and God, I'm bringing this to you. I can't save myself. I need a substitute. And that's what that lamb speaks of. Okay, now, this reminds me. Uh, earlier this week on Thursday night, I was actually standing right here, and uh, it was 8.20 on Thursday night, and I had been invited. I always get invited months before, and I know what I'm supposed to prepare for. It's whatever community Bible study is studying. They want me to introduce the lesson. And I thought, wow. Introduce the book of Genesis. has 50 chapters. If you read it at this speed that I'm talking right now, it takes 150 minutes to read it. And you want me to introduce 150 minute long of truth in 20 minutes. Oh, they says, no, no. No, you have 10 minutes to introduce it and 10 minutes to apply it. They said, you have to apply it too. And I said, wow. Apply 150 minutes of truth in 10 minutes after you introduce it for 10 minutes. So, but you know what they were saying? They're saying that, that we don't want to merely be hearers of the word, which is probably one of the biggest maladies of the church, that we are steeped in truth. We have more truth than any generation's ever had. You know, a typical, my study Bible that I have at home has 25,000 exegetical notes in it. Do you know how many verses are on the Bible? 31,000. I have a note on almost every verse. We have more knowledge than any generation in the history of the church has. And we apply often the Bible the least. So, how do you apply, go back to verse 9, and what are the lessons that we can apply to our life from the very first time God allows us to see saints singing in heaven? What, what lessons can we derive? Number one, and, and look, look at how these tie. It says in verse 9, you are worthy to take the scroll. How can we apply that? Well, if Jesus is the creator and owner of all things, the application is, I should surrender back all I have to Jesus as my creator and owner. You know, it's a very liberating thing to do this. You know, this week one of our cars died, and it wouldn't run, and you know how mechanical I am. You remember, I'm the one that pulls the spark plug wires off to make them get better gas mileage. And so they tried to keep me away from the car, and they called AAA. And uh, the AAA man came, you know how they have the super, you know, to start it? And he says, doesn't start. And I said, yeah, I, I mean, I'm enough a mechanic to know that. And he said, it'll have to be towed. And I said, yeah. And so they, they towed it off. You know what's really wonderful to think about? That's not my car. Whose is it? Yeah. The Lord is the creator and owner of all things. If you have a car that doesn't work, if you have a job that isn't working, if you have a body that's not working, do you know what is incredibly liberating to meditate on the fact that I need to surrender that broken down car, that broken down career, and that broken down body, and that broken down relationship to the Lord? And he, 
He is the true owner, and he also has directions on what to do when you have a broken down career and a broken down body and a broken down anything. Surrender back. Now, now look, look at this verse. This is the first verse. I know we always think of Romans 12, 1 and 2, and that's a great one to think of. But you know what? In heaven, they're always talking about blood redemption. And look what 1 Corinthians 6 says. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you're not your own? I don't know if you read over the, the last few days that uh, during this whole 911, we're, we're just learning about all the attacks that are going on. It's just slowly filtering through the news. But do you know what one of them was? The, the royal heir of the House of Windsor, you know, Prince Harry from the, the Windsor family, you know, the king and queen of England, their last name is Windsor. You know, he was at Camp Bastion. That's a British post that's 13 square miles. It's the most heavily defended military installation that we've built in recent years. It has, it has incredible layers of defense. You ought to read about it. They were able to kill soldiers near him. They were targeting the prince himself. And you know what is amazing about that? To think about how... how in this world, nothing is secure, nothing, everything can be taken away from us. I, I saw someone this morning walking in, I said, hey, how are you today? And they said, great. I said, how's your job? They said, I don't have it anymore. And, you know, they were one of the most securely employed people I've ever seen. Everything is insecure. What's the solution to that? To realize you, verse 20, were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit. They belong to God. Surrender back to God. Now, to do that, can you reach in front of you to the, to the green book, okay? What we're going to do is we're going to read a couple lines from the hymn book, and we're going to do that two or three times, so don't get rid of it just before we go. But turn to number 366, because what's neat is people throughout history have meditated on the truths we're looking at this morning, and different ones of them, in fact, Judson W. Van Deventer is the name at the bottom, in 1896 was meditating on the ownership that God had of his complete life, body, soul, and spirit. And he wrote this response, which is very similar to what they're singing in heaven. And I thought, maybe we could uh, offer this. Now, what I'd like to do is, I would like to, to read two stanzas of this, but I want you to think of this. Imagine that you're standing at a campfire, and it's dark out, and you've been hearing powerful, challenging sermons from some powerful youth evangelist or speaker and now it's come to the moment of decision and you're standing in a big circle around that giant I was just at one at Word of Life this summer with with hundreds and hundreds of teenagers and that scene happened and you know 200 of them responded they walked up to that fire with their little stick that represented their life and they said I completely absolutely never turn back surrender again my life to you and they threw it in that's kind of the context of this this him that we're going to read the words. So let's stand, get the blood going. That'll show who's really awake. Okay, here we go. We're going to read the first and then the third stanza together. All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him. In his presence daily live. Third stanza. All to Jesus I surrender. Make me, Savior, wholly thine. May thy Holy Spirit fill me. May I know thy power divine. Now the refrain. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. You may be seated, but now I'll give you the warning. You know how they put a warning on everything, you know, this has salt in it or can cause cancer? Do you know what the warning Ecclesiastes 5 is? Ecclesiastes 5 says, Be not hasty to utter anything on earth, for God is in heaven listening. Therefore, let your words be few. Why? God, God hears that. Did you know that, that you can make the words of these hymns an actual agreement of surrender, offering ourselves back. Well, we should reflect on Christ's ownership. Secondly, 
What does it mean that Jesus is the judge of our life? How do we apply that? Well, Paul tells us, 2 Corinthians 5.10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Each one will receive things done in his body. Do you know what that means? It isn't future that someday this is going to happen. Right now, Jesus is watching. Jesus is right now deciding what parts of our life. It's not at the judgment seat that he decides. He's already decided. He's just showing us. Right now, he's watching and assessing. Uh, this week, I, f- I forget what day it was, we had a broken window. While we were away, someone, I don't know how we live so far out in the country, but someone looked like an errant bullet, but, you know, it, it broke one of the windows. And so we finally had the person come, and, and they were changing it, and the guy pulled up in his truck, and, and I said, can I watch you do it? He said, oh, sure. And I could tell he liked his job. I mean, he had a... Um, caulk gun kind of like side mounted and he pulled it out like this you know <laughs> you can tell the people that like what they do and he had his caulk gun in there and he had a little uh, caulk gun wiper on this side and and so he put his little suction thing on that window and went, popped it in there he did a lot of other stuff and but this was the dramatic moment I was watching him because you know many times Bonnie has asked me to help her to caulk you know like the around the bathtub and stuff and so I get that tube and I squeeze it and it looks like you know like a caterpillar going like this you know and it's blotchy and then I run my finger on it and then it's all over and I wipe it and finally I just get a wet rag and hope this guy I was watching him I said you don't mind if I watch he said no and he got up there on his ladder and he went and he pulled out his thing and he went that fast he caulked that window and then he took his rag out went and he went I said, how do you do that so fast? And I told him how I get it all over. And he said, I've been doing it a long time, and I really like it. And I thought, <laughs> he doesn't mind me watching him because he, he has mastered what he does. He, he knows exactly. It wasn't his company. He worked for someone. He was talking about what a wonderful boss he had. I thought, what a model person. And then he told me he's a part-time sheriff in South Haven. I said, well, remember me. If I'm ever speeding in South Haven, you know, I'll smile at you. But, but you know what? There is that kind of watching where you want to be watched and where you're trying to please the one that's watching you. And then there's the other one. You've ever watched someone do something and they, they drop it and they go, why are you watching me? And I'm just so nervous as you're watching me. Did you know that we're supposed to know that Jesus is watching everything we do? And instead of nervously feeling bad and saying, why are you watching me? We're supposed to kind of be like Mr. Cockgun and say, whether therefore I eat or drink or whatever I do, I want to do it for your glory. And if in any way, I mean, you know, this man said to me, he says, now this is, you know, it's your home. He didn't realize it wasn't, but it's your home. And he said, I just want to do it just right, just for you. You know, I want it to be just right. I thought that's how we're supposed to go through life, pleasing the Lord in everything. We should reflect on Jesus as a judge of our life on a daily basis. Don't wait till the judgment seat right now. We should be grateful Jesus is the lamb that was slain for our sins. In fact, uh, we should often reflect on what it means. Um, in 1 John 1, 7, if you want to take your hymn books, let's turn to number 196, because I want to show you, this is a testimony, 196 is a testimony of a man that was so acutely aware of his sin that he tried to commit suicide three times in 1772. Think Revolutionary War, he lived in Britain, he was, he was very accomplished, but he was so convicted of his sins, first he tried to fall on his knife. And he fell on his knife three times, and the third time the blade broke off. So he got up, and he goes down to the store, and he buys a razor strap. And he takes the razor strap, and he make, fixes it up, and he lops it over some bar somewhere, and puts it around his neck, and he jumps off the chair, and the razor strap broke. And so he goes back and buys a third instrument. And this time he tried something else and, and he put on the doorknob and he threw himself down and he suffocated himself enough that he went unconscious, but it broke too and when his head hit the floor, he woke up. <laughs> and he, he, his journal, he talks, he walked and he says, I can't, I can't do anything in life, I can't even kill myself. And then he understood the gospel and wrote his testimony. The one that could cleanse us from all sin. There's a fountain. So I thought we have three minutes left. It would be wonderful to end our time remembering 
the one who has forgiven us of all of our sins. So let's stand up, and we're just going to sing, or I mean not sing, we're going to say the words of this before we pray. And I want you, never should there is a fountain filled with blood ever be the same for you. Think of a guy at the end literally of his rope. I mean, he is at the end of everything, and he wants to know he's not guilty in the sight of God because he was conscious that he had sinned. But he needed to know about the one who said, I don't condemn you. You're forgiven. And he wrote this testimony when he did. Let's read it. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. Lose all their guilty stains. Lose all their guilty stains. And sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. Third stanza. Dear dying lamb, thy precious blood shall never lose its power till all the ransomed church of God be saved to sin no more. Be saved to sin no more. Be saved to sin no more. Till all the ransom church of God be saved, sin no more. We should be grateful that Jesus is the lamb that took our place and allowed God to treat him like he committed every one of our sins. And he took all of my sins on himself. He took all of my guilt, bore all of the punishment, and then he treats me like I never committed any of those sins. That's the incredible exchange of the gospel. And they're still singing about it in heaven. Amen? Let's bow for a word of prayer. And as we pray, I would invite you, if you have a need of someone to talk with you about your soul, if you're not sure you know Christ, there'll be godly Titus II women and elders here at the front. If you just need to pray about a burden in your life, maybe you're one whose body isn't working or your job isn't working or whatever, relationships, you want to just counsel and pray and talk, they'll be here. If you're new and have never been to our reception, I'll be in the Fellowship Center uh, with some of the elders and love to tell you more about Calvary. Tonight, the concert, the baptism, the communion, and then the wonderful talking about what the scriptures say we're supposed to do with these bodies that belong to the Lord. Let's bow for prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for letting us just get a little look into the words of the worship of heaven. Help us to apply them, not just hear all this, but help us to be doers and to realize that you've cleansed us of all our guilty stains. When the devil tempts us to despair and reminds us of our sin within, help us to remember you, O Christ, who stand at the right hand of the Father and say, no, I have taken all that punishment. That sin is upon me. The record of it is erased. And that's my child. Thank you for the blessing. May we serve you who own us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And all of God's people said, amen. God bless you as you go.